Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this um, Cambridge Union panel on police violence and racism in the United States and elsewhere. I'm Adam Davies, president of the union, and thank you so much wherever you are. Um, in terms of the format of this panel, we will have each of our five panelists will give a brief five minute kind of summary of their views on kind of the current situation. Then we'll go on to questions, a mix from questions between the member the panelists from me, and then hopefully you'll be able to ask some questions in the chat box to the right of this video. If you'd like more content like this, both this term and later, subscribe to our YouTube page, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, we're all, all platforms. Uh, so wherever you are, we're there. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, uh, Michael Denzel Smith. Michael is a writer, he's the author of Invisible Man, Got the Whole World Watching, and a fellow at the Nation Institute. Michael? Uh, fellow at Type Media Center, just as a point of clarification, My apologies. he's changed his name. Um, but yeah, so the, the question has been put to us, what can we do about uh, policing and racism? Uh, and I mean, my, my very first answer to that is quite simple and, and it's abolish the police. Um, and, you know, that has become sort of uh, a part of the analysis of this moment in particular, which speaks to me uh, and says that there's something different about now than there was five or six years ago when there was the an, an uprising against police violence in response to the killing of Michael Brown and, and Ferguson. Uh, that you know the call then was indict, uh, convict, send those killer cops to jail. And now it's defund the police, which comes out of the abolitionist uh, framework and, and analysis of the, the criminal legal system. Uh, the idea being, you know, you're taking funds and resources away from the police as a means of community reinvestment and an eventual hopeful uh, disbanding of the police altogether. Uh, and you know it, it's it's seen as this like far left wing idea that one would uh, get rid of police altogether. But I think also it's happening then at the same time where it's in vogue to call out systemic racism, right? As as a term, say you know it is a problem systemic racism. Uh, without ever identifying the systems, <laughs> without ever saying these are the systems and these are the ways in which they work, in which they perpetuate and uphold white supremacy, the way uh, the ideology of white supremacy undergirds their very existence. Uh, and so when we're doing this work of, uh, of deconstructing systemic racism, we have to ask ourselves, how the systems got to be that way in the first place, what systems are responsible. Uh, and then we asked the question about the necessity of those systems, the necessity of those institutions that have been built. And I think anything that proves itself to be unnecessary needs to be abolished. Uh, and the police, I believe, uh, and so many others are coming to agree are an unnecessary uh, institution in that their very purpose is the suppression of uh, the people who are on the margins, the people who do not benefit from systems of white supremacist heteropatriarchal capitalism. That That is baked into their very nature, that they are they're, they're dependent, up, their existence is dependent upon the need of the ruling classes to manage those who, who would demand equality. Uh, now, the messaging around the police has become different, right? Like they protect and serve. Uh, that's a PR slogan. <laughs> uh, that, that's something that has come to uh, embody the idea and the imagination of uh, of people in particularly in the states around what policing means but that's never been their job that's never been their role uh, and so the question for me then becomes to, to put to other folks um, who believe in policing is what role do police serve 
in a society that is based on actual equality and justice, right? Like when people are provided the things that they actually need, when you're provided housing, food, healthcare, education, recreation, uh, all of the things that like make for a good life. What, what, at what point do, do police come into play there? Um, and you know, we can talk about like just all the bad things that people do to one another, but so many of those bad things are born out of not having, are born out of the systems of hierarchy uh, that we all buy into. And so when you eliminate that, do you need the police? Um, and I'll stop talking now just because I know other folks will, will have things to offer on this point, but I think it just, if we're talking about eliminating racism, it means eliminating the systems that uphold it, the systems that ensure its existence. Great, thank you very much for that, Michael. So our next speaker is Ijeris Dixon. She's an organizer and director of Vision Change Win. Ijeris? Hi, everyone. I'm Ijeris Dixon, and I think one of the most important things to know about me is that I've been working on community-based solutions to addressing violence for approaching 20 years now. So when I hear the question, what can be done about police violence and racism? The first thing is I think the term police violence is, is in itself its own redundancy, right? The police are violent. And so reducing police violence would involve ending and abolishing the police. What to do about police violence and racism? Well, as Michael was saying, and I'm sure other folks are going to talk about, there is a history within policing that is inherently racist. Right, like if the idea was the protection of capital and myself coming from a community that was once seen as property, right? Like the idea is that like when you are in a community that is inherently seen um, and has been named to be violent, then the police were designed to be violent towards us. So there's a lot of work that people have done in efforts of reform, but I grew up in a family that did not call the police because the police are inherently violent and the police are inherently racist. My mom grew up in segregated New Orleans and they could not call the police because the police were the KKK, were the white citizens council. So there, I think what's absolutely necessary is not only the work of just reimagining a society where our systems aren't inherently violent, aren't inherently racist, aren't inherently oppressive, but building the work alongside so usually when people start to talk about abolition, people start to freak out, well, what do we do instead? And I was like, well, not every solution requires police. In fact, no solution that I can think of requires police. It may, so um, in my, in the building in which I live, a mom had a son who was having a mental health crisis, called the police. Her son was holding a brush. The police thought that the brush was a weapon. Um, and really, they just assumed that because he was a young black man, um, that there was that that there was nothing else to be done but kill him. These situations are fairly normal for black people. What happens in these moments when a cop when a cop kills a black person and it's put on camera, the crisis of knowledge is in, is, is is not in black people. It's it's around white communities waking up and, and, and having to see like what's happening to our communities. Like if the police were not inherently racist and if the police were not inherently violent, I would not know how to um, deescalate violence myself. I would not have grown up in communities where we were running cop watch, where we were building community-based intervention systems. So I think it's really about reimagining what liberatory governance looks like, giving people the material needs so that, as Michael was saying, so that they have the food and the housing and the jobs that they need to take care of themselves, and then figuring out ways that we're going to intervene in violence, whether that's interpersonal violence, sexual violence, homophobic and transphobic violence, um, and a whole host of other pieces. The, the issue is the state is violent. And so I've decided to not work on reforming the state. I've decided to work to place my efforts and building up our communities and building safer communities. Um, and 
that's all I have to say. Great. Thank you so much for that, Ijeris. Our next um, panelist is Alex Vitale, who's professor of sociology at Brooklyn College and the author of End of Policing. Alex? Thank you, Adam. Really glad to be here today to talk about this really important issue. So I appreciate the invitation. You know, people ask, why are the protests different this time over five, six years ago? And, and Michael kind of alluded to this in his comments earlier. I think part of it is because people were sold a bill of good five years ago. They were told, don't worry, we're going to fix policing. We're, we're going we're gonna to solve some of these racism problems. We're going to import a whole set of uh, procedural reforms to policing. We're going to make them more professional and less biased and more transparent, and we're going to hold them more accountable. We're uh, going to implement a set of trainings and, and technological fixes. And Minneapolis was kind of a shining star for this. They adopted a whole set of reforms that came from President Obama's task force on 21st century policing. The kinds of reforms they adopted were things like implicit bias training, mindfulness training, de-escalation training, requirements that officers intervene when they see another officer commit misconduct, that officers wear body cameras, that we create that they they created early warning systems to identify potentially dangerous officers. And none of it made any difference. The officer who killed Mr. Floyd that day had had de-escalation training and anti-bias training. The officers who stood there and watched knew that they were legally required to intervene to save George Floyd's life, and they did nothing. The fact is, is that these reforms aren't capable of fixing policing, even if the police really did abide by them. That's because they misunderstand the nature of the policing problem that we have in America. They assume that the neutral, professional, transparent enforcement of the law is automatically beneficial for everyone. But this just isn't the case. The law does not benefit everyone equally. The legal systems we have in place facilitate profound inequalities. There's a famous 19th century saying that the law and its majesty forbids both the rich and the poor from sleeping under bridges, begging in the streets, and stealing bread. But of course, the rich don't have to do these things. And by the same token, the problems of racial disparity and things like drug arrests can't be fixed by anti-bias training for individual officers. We don't need to give narcotics units implicit bias training. We need to end the war on drugs because the structural racism is not really in the minds of individual officers by itself. It's in the decision by elected officials to turn the problems of black and brown communities and poor white communities over to the police to manage. In the United States, we've created mass homelessness, mass untreated mental illness, mass economic precarity, and then we criminalize those populations for being disorderly and dangerous rather than addressing their true needs. And it is this core understanding that drives the defund police and police abolition movements. It's not about making officers nicer or friendlier or better integrated into the community. It's about reducing the scope of policing in every way that we can possibly imagine. And these are concrete struggles in cities across the United States who've identified specific budget numbers that they want shifted over to community identified interventions. And I'll just finish by saying it's important to understand that this is not just about policing anymore. When we look back at the uprisings and revolts of the 1960s in the United States, we don't say, oh, well, that was just about policing. The movement we're in today is about a broad crisis and the leadership of both political parties to do anything at all to address the problems of deep racial disparities and economic inequality in the United States. This is a generational cry for political change 
and I only hope it makes a difference in the long run. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those very interesting comments. Our next panelist is Roy Alston, who has worked as a major in the Dallas Police Department and as a consultant for the Institute for Intergovernmental Research. Roy? Okay, uh, thank you very much, and I appreciate you having me today. I'm going to take a probably a little different approach uh, than most everybody else and give you kind of a historical, um, give you some insight to my time as a police officer on the street. Um, Eugene William was a 17-year-old Black boy in 1919 who was stoned to death by white swimmers in Lake, uh, uh, because he swam in the white portion of Lake Michigan. As a result, um, Black people protested and 500 people were injured and 38 people were killed. Chicago initiated the first report, the first uh, convened the first commission to actually look at the cause of the violence. And the commission uh, noted that systematic participation in mob violence by the police was the cause. Every single major report since that time has documented the, that it has come to the same basic conclusion that when police officers had the choice to protect communities of color, uh, against white mob violence, they chose to abate and assist white mobs and disarm black people. These, these reports further concluded that, black, uh, included that police were systematically engaging racial bias when targeting black suspects uh, and were not held accountable for criminal behavior. So there's a lot of history that has to be understood here. Uh, the 13th Amendment uh, abolished uh, slavery in this country, yet for, for those who were deemed criminal. Uh, this loophole was exploited um, by the South and began what was called mass criminalization of police um, just because you were Black. And the driving force was economic. Large plantations needed uh, labor in order to, um, you know, work the fields, but, you know, Black people were free. And then came this movie called The Birth of a Nation, which was an extremely controversial movie released in 1915, which really depicted and portrayed Blacks in this country as criminal while portraying the KKK as this heroic force um, that was uh, championing the lost cause. Many white people throughout history, throughout the time in the United States, believed what they saw in this movie, and this fueled what we call the national intentional criminalization of being black in America. Once labeled uh, black, once labeled a criminal, blacks were thrown in jail, um, blacks were loaned out to large uh, plantation owners by the, by, by the prisons, and then you, on top of this, on top of all of this, you have this grave injustice, which was systematic oppression, uh, segregation, Jim Crow, and the Great Migration period that shaped the maldistribution of goods for Black people in this country. Access to housing, access to hospital, access to schools, access to education, access to simple things, social programs, and access to, to uh, even things that are leisure. All these restrictions were, were enforced by white citizens, but they were especially enforced by the police. Um, law enforcement was originally designed and tooled to enforce the status quo of oppression, um, beginning with its roots in uh, the, the slave patrols in South Carolina. And since then, public policing in America has really been on the wrong side of social change in every instance in America. So when we kind of understand that backdrop, we begin to understand that it's really not about police violence and racism, it's really about police violence based on race. So we must begin to reimagine what policing can be in America. I know there's people are talking about defunding the police and reallocating that. I will tell you, I'm not a big, I'm not a, a supporter of that. What I am a supporter of is reimagining policing in America. We must begin first by making police a true profession. There must be a national standard for selecting, training, certifying, and holding accountable all police officers in this country. We must create and maintain a database of all police officers in this country and track those officers that have repeated incidents of excessive force and violating people's civil rights. Like other professions, we must remove police officers that continue to violate the Constitution and civil rights of citizens, that violate their training and violate their policy and outright break the law for which other citizens would immediately be arrested for and placed in jail. There must be a national duty to intervene policy where police officers prevent other police officers from violating the civil rights of citizens without re retaliation. Police unions and associations must stop protecting bad police officers at the expense of good officers and, the, and at the expense of public trust and legitimacy. We must increase the pay of police officers. If you want a professional police department, you must pay for a professional police officer. 
we must eliminate qualified immunity for police officers in this country. Qualified immunity is a legal rule that allow, that shields police officers uh, from being sued by, their, by the victims and their families, even when the peace off police officer violates a person's civil rights. Qualified immunity is how a police officer in Minnesota can place his knee uh, in, the, in the back of a black man for eight minutes and 46 seconds without a care in the world. This was not the first time this officer did this. This was just the first time that Derek Chavin of the Minneapolis Police Department was filmed with his knee in the back of the neck of a handcuffed and compliant George Floyd for almost nine minutes, resulting in Floyd's death. Floyd begged for his life and was motionless for the last three minutes with no pulse. As onlookers watched and pleaded for the police to remove their knee from his back, even while medics were there trying to treat uh, Floyd. Third, racism is a, manifest, is a manifestation of hate, and hate is a disease in America that must be cured. Nelson Mandela once said, no one is born hating another person because of his color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must be taught to hate. And if they, if they can learn to hate, they can most certainly learn to love, which is more natural to the human heart than, than the opposite. Let's formally apologize for slavery in this country and all of the terrible things that have happened to people of color for so many years and begin with what I would call reconciliation and healing in this country. Let's begin to take seriously how the system is set up to limit the potential of, of people of color in this country. The alternative is an incident far more egregious than what happened to George Floyd and an entire nation wondering what form of evil will show its ugly head next. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roy, for those comments. It was nice to see some different views here. Our final panelist is Denise Hurd, who's professor at, in public health at UC Berkeley, specializing on racial disparities in health, particularly on the legal system. Denise? Hi. Um, it's, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this conversation. Uh, it's really exciting to hear from such uh, knowledgeable uh, panelists. Uh, and I'd like to echo uh, a lot of the really important points that uh, have been made by other panelists, uh, just thinking in terms of the history of slavery and the important role of state-sponsored violence in supporting slavery as a violent institution and throughout different historical periods, uh, reinforcing the domination in various forms of African-Americans. Um, so one of the things I wanted to bring to the conversation is that um, as somebody who uh, is in public health, I think a lot about Black lives and whether or not they really do matter. And um, I didn't start off studying the criminal justice system or the police, but I came to that because I began to realize that policing in many forms has an incredible impact on the the enormous health disparities that we see. And I know that right now, people are now thinking about COVID-19 and the health disparities in terms of COVID. Well, unfortunately, I mean, it was disappointing, but not shocking for many of us in this field to see that because these are the disparities that we see every day, all the time. Um, and I think the interrelationship between policing uh, and the structural racism that we see produce those kind of inequities and, and uh, they produce and they reinforce them. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the vast impact of uh, policing on black, brown and native communities in the US. I think a lot of us are familiar with police killings. They're about the official records say there are a thousand a year uh, with uh, African-American men having a rate of three times that of, of, of white men. However, police killings are just the vast, they are the tip of a much bigger iceberg. As someone in public health, um, I looked at the burden of people going to the emergency room from policing. And um, uh, uh, Feldon and his colleagues looked at those figures from 2001 to 2014, and they found that 683,000 people uh, had gone to the emergency rooms uh, for 
as a result of law enforcement. So that's about 55,000 people a year. So, and those are reported injuries by the police. So that's 55 times what we see in terms of uh, actual deaths. And in addition, the hyper-policing that we've seen in some communities like stop and frisk and Terry stops in New York City uh, and in other places like Los Angeles. Uh, so over like an eight year period, more, you know, 5 million uh, people were stopped in their communities and 80 to 90% of those were uh, black and brown men. Those kinds of, that, that kind of surveillance, that kind of invasive policing uh, is psychologically traumatizing, may trigger PS, uh, PTSD, depression, and even be related to physical diseases such as diabetes, high blood pressure, asthma, and being overweight. Um, I'm also struck by the irony of police violence that adds to an existing wave of black disease and death that's basically driven by structural racism as some of our panelists have pointed out. So a number of African-Americans have been criminalized and targeted for simply being black while trying to undergo normal lives in their neighborhood in contexts such as driving while black, bird watching, sleeping, barbecuing, attending church while black. And in addition, I think one of the panelists mentioned this, blatantly sick and vulnerable people have been targeted by the police. So a substantial number of those killed by police are young black men suffering from untreated mental illness and from problems stemming from poverty and drugs. Shockingly, a number of people, and I, I did a paper and I'm doing research on this, with diabetes and other health problems have been injured and killed by the police. When people call for help, police have been known to come to households and kill the sick person on site. So, um, you know, these are individuals that have been impacted, but these kind of violent encounters would police produce a strong ripple effect, diminishing the health and well being of people who simply live in areas where their neighbors are killed, hurt, or psychologically traumatized? One author wrote about the number of people going to funerals, reliving, and being re traumatized as this is what's happening now with George Floyd, but it's happening all the time in many communities. And so, um, you know, in these communities, invasive police behavior increases social fragmentation, civil disengagement, people don't wanna go out and vote. It's economically very draining to these communities as well as harming health. And these kind of communities that have suffered this way are more likely to become the breeding grounds for crime, which increases police surveillance. So as, as many of you have pointed out, structural racism and discrimination are at the root of widespread uh, systemic increase in, in police violence. The war on drugs or the war on poor and disfranchised communities uh, increased police presence, militarizing the police and the culture of routine police violence. And in addition, court decisions such as Graham versus Connor roll back civil rights protections and court oversight of police action. Policies stemming from these rulings have increased police discretion and power and limited responsibility for police killings and injuries. Um, so I think addressing the problems of police violence will require not only, as people have said, actions around the police, uh, but other kinds of actions. Um, one of the, I think one of the issues that we're also seeing with COVID-19 is that people are talking about, they're sort of blaming black people for these illnesses. And, you know, when Eric Garner died, uh, Congressman Peter King said if he had not had asthma and a heart condition and was so obese, almost definitely he, he would have not died. These kinds of statements have been used to exonerate um, you know, the police from the harm that they caused. So I think greater change needs to happen at the level of reversing the court, in, court decisions, amplifying police autonomy, um, and implementing, I think, broader policies that people have already mentioned, such as school and housing desegregation, economic development, investment into health resources and political empowerment. I think um, those changes are necessary to make any real and lasting progress on these issues. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for those, Denise.
Um, one question from George Walker, the entire panel, uh, I think, is kind of how far can the problems of race, racist police violence be addressed through the existing social and political institutions by voting Dem or Republican? So what do you think the political parties have to play in this? Um, uh, Alex, you mentioned something about how this is a bipartisan problem. Um, do you think that kind of organized party politics, to any of you, um, can solve this? I think it has to eventually. I just don't think it's prepared to right now, especially at the national level. There's real gridlock in Washington about taking this seriously. Obviously, the Trump administration just wants to double down with policing and even military intervention. But the, the Democrats in Congress have been putting forward bills that just include uh, more procedural reforms for the most part, and a few good things like ending no-knock warrant uh, services and uh, you know a real ban on chokeholds and, and dialing back military equipment. But they're not dialing back federal law enforcement. They're not ending all kinds of federal programs that, that intensify policing in our communities. Uh, at the local level, there is some reason to think that we may make some progress here, in part because what's been happening in the U.S. in recent years is the rise of a whole generation of more radical local politicians who don't take leadership from the National Democratic Party. And these are the folks in Minneapolis, for instance, who are looking at real change there. Yeah. Uh I can jump in. I think that politicians follow movements. So if you were to think about um, the 1968 Civil Rights Act, that it, politicians followed what social movements push people to do. And the way that radical politicians get elected are that there are people protesting in the streets and organizing around a set of demands. So the, what we're seeing now is a police violence movement. I've been within the police violence movement for at least 15 years, but the concept of abolishing the police, abolishing prisons, and the movements around it, critical resistance, the work of Angela Davis, we're talking about the late 70s. So it's, um, it is absolutely possible for this to move into party politics, but it won't be started by party, party politics. It'll be started by movements of people. And the other issue is, I don't know how many people have like directly organized with a person who's been attacked by the police or a family who's lost someone, but the first thing that happens is that they start to actually get attacked by other police officers. People lose their jobs. People start to show up at their homes. So there's also a way that there has been active surveillance and suppression of people who are calling out police violence. And it's even a part of the work that you do when you are building people up to, to speak their story, you start to safety plan for what are the police unions going to do and what are individual officers going to do for these people. So it's both about building up the strength of the movement to push the politicians. Like that's the, that's the order of operations. The Dems have never, and particularly the Republicans have never led on these issues. They get pushed and it's about, um, it's about the people pushing them. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in and say, you know, in, 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 the, in the early 1900s in this country, you could have been a, a physician, a surgeon with no, with no training at all, with a high school diploma. Now, I think I'm a pretty smart person. I, I would like to be a brain surgeon, but I don't have the requisite skills and talent and credentials to do that. Most every profession in this country has gone through what I call professionalization. And policing in America has yet to go through its professionalization. We, we and I haven't been a police officer on the street for 15 years. I recognize the, the resistance inherent in police departments across the country for reform and change. The president's report on 21st century policing was a roadmap for change, but you'll be surprised how many police leaders simply did not read the document in order to make their agencies better. The report that we, I, I participated in on the mass protests in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, uh, after the Michael Brown shooting, we, we set out a roadmap on how to successfully handle the uh, mass protests in the country to allow people to exercise their constitutional rights. And I was literally appalled watching some of these police departments, even my own police department, not even uh, do the things that we recommended in the document, like throwing tear gas at uh, pro peaceful protesters without egress. So in, in, until we actually make policing in this country a profession, standardized selection, standardized training, uh, standardized accountability, a database controlling all police officers, tracking down those who are 
accountable for violating people's civil rights and throwing them out of the profession and getting rid of uh, qualified immunity that which protects police officers who, uh, who do uh, bad across the board. Uh, we're not gonna have what we really want and have the promise of policing in America. I believe we still need policing in this country. We just need to reimagine what policing can do and what it will be able to accomplish if we go through the tough work of professionalizing a profession that, has, that claims to be a profession, but truly doesn't meet the criteria of a press profession. I was pulled over in 2000, let's see, I, was a, I started paying a police officer in 2003. I was pulled over by a police officer in far east Texas. Uh, and the police officer uh, came to my door, uh, to my car, and he hadn't even been to the police academy. He was on the street. He was a, he was a deputy sheriff on the street pulling people over and hadn't even been to a, an academy. It takes more hours to become a, a barber in the state of Texas than it does to become a police officer. And I think in that in itself is criminal. So until we standardize policing across the United States and mandate that all the way down to the street level in these communities, uh, we're going to continue to have a problem. Yeah, so just to follow on from that, you said kind of the 21st century, kind of the report on 21st century policing gave um, police forces a roadmap in 2014. Why wasn't that followed? Kind of the um, kind of speeches by Michael and by others um, talked about how kind of police agencies just aren't willing to do it. If they were given a roadmap five years ago, why hasn't that roadmap been taken? Well, and that's a very good question. So I'm going to tell you, um, and I was a practicing police officer at the time, a lot of the police leadership, um, they had the mentality of, uh, you know, their heads in the sand. This can never happen to us. It won't happen to us. We're better than this. When the Department of Justice really was trying to encourage police agencies, look, say, look, we're not blaming you for anything. We're just saying this is a roadmap. This is a checklist. If you're not doing these things, then you probably should be doing these things. And oh, by the way, we're going to make all these resources available to you to do that. The same thing was with the mass protest we, bought, we did with the assessment. It was, it was the same thing. We're saying, well, we don't think Ferguson, Missouri is going to happen to you specifically, but if you are a professional, you should learn from what we've already, we, you should learn the lessons that have already been paid for in sweat and blood and not make these mistakes again. Police agencies in this country are not learning organizations. They simply resist change and resist reform and they just wait you out. And unfortunately, we, we need to put enlightened leaders in place that understand the mandates of reform and understand the unique relationships that police officers have with their communities. It's a local issue. The relationship with a police officer and his in this community is a local issue. And we have to build that relationship based on our professionalism. And oh, by the way, well, you know, policing must become a learning organization. We pay for these lessons already. And oh, by the way, if we if it if it goes quiet now. Let's say five years from now, something even major more happens, more egregious than what happened to George Floyd happens in this country. We'll be sitting back scrambling, asking ourselves, why are the police militarized? Why are the police suppressing people's uh, constitutional rights? Why are the police gassing people? Why are the police using armored vehicles? When we, we keep we having to learn the lessons over and over simply because we don't have the right enlightened leaders in place to do the right things nationally. Now, I know of some that are very enlightened, that are doing very good things out there, but those things are being overshadowed by the simple mistakes that we keep making over and over and over again as, as a profession. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Michael, could you hop on? I think you have some things to say uh, in response to that. Yeah, uh, I think, you know, I hear this, but I don't want more professional ass whoopers. Like, I don't, I don't like that's not what I'm after, you know? Um, and I think that that's really what we have to come down to with the idea of policing. Um, what is policing meant to accomplish? And I think that that's a question that, that like we're, we're not wrestling with here. Maybe we just don't have enough time to, to do so. Uh, and what the police have been called in to do too often is to fill in the cracks where we have failed with regards to providing for the general welfare of the people or where providing for the general welfare of the people uh, goes against the ideologies of our hierarchies based on race, gender, sexual identity, uh, what have you, uh, on class. Um, and so 
there's there's that part of it to say you know the police are meant to come in and then clean up our streets uh to get the bad people away from us well the bad people are victims more often than not of these failed systems uh and so the first thing has to be about whether or not it's it's necessary to be arresting uh so many people that all the people that we currently arrest there, there needs to be reform around decriminalization uh and and ensuring that we just don't have as many crimes on the books first and foremost. And then we're talking about like in actual, like Jairus is saying, you know, the actual investment in these communities to provide for the things that people need. Now, then we're talking about reducing the amount of violence that's actually present, right? And then we're asking, okay, in the face of violence that may happen because we're not saying that you know that violence uh goes away altogether but in the face of uh any harm that a person does to someone else what do the police do that is helpful in this situation the only thing that the police have at their disposal is another form of violence right like they can arrest they can shoot they can beat they can threaten with the with the you know the full force of the state behind them right um and and the question though is what does that do? What does that serve us? What does that serve the people who've been victimized? And what does that serve the perpetrators of that harm, right? Like all that really is, <laughs> is a form of revenge. And the state shouldn't be in the business of enacting revenge on behalf of people. The state needs to be involved, if we have the, the existence of a state, it needs to be about justice. It needs to be about the needs of people and what, what can be done to uh, engage in forms of harm reduction uh, and then the ways in which we, we uh, mitigate out how to uh, settle disputes when harm has has occurred right like and that's the work that Egeris is involved in like building those community relations so that people are are doing that work without <clears throat> the need of the threat of violence coming down on them from the state so that we're building stronger community ties so that when those things happen because it's just there's no proof that shows that the police help in any of the things that we're we that we are you know afraid of uh when we when, we, when people say oh abolish the police what are you going to do about murders well the police don't prevent murders they just come in and they try to catch the person after it's done right but even in that situation they don't catch the person that often and when they do they may not they don't catch the right person or or accuse the right person that often uh when when someone's raped or sexually assaulted well the police don't take that seriously anyway and also it's the second most common form of police violence so we're talking of, and, and domestic violence being perpetrated by police at higher rates than the general population so what i'm saying is i don't want more professionalizing of that uh, that, uh, that as a you know as a mode of operating within communities i want those problems to be addressed without needing state sanctioned revenge to satiate people's bloodlust. Uh, we need to be focusing on ways that actually do things that 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 are not further harming our communities. Uh, Denise, I think you had something to say. Um, I think you're muted. But... Yes. Right. Uh, yeah, I did. I, I, I did want to say something because I wanted to point out that, um, you know, about I think it's about a third of African American men are going to spend uh, some time in criminal justice contact. And so we have the powers of the criminal justice system are just pervasive in black and brown communities. And this idea of having there's a, I think there's a strong need to scale back that presence in these communities. I'm thinking now of, um, you know, it, sort of the pipeline from the educational pipeline to prison pipeline, or for some communities, it's edu the education, the prison, and then the deportation pipeline, 
Why is it that we no longer have nurses in schools? We have peace officers in schools. Why is it that school discipline has taken the form now of intervention by police? So I, I think this notion of where we're putting our public funding, we're putting a lot of funding into the criminal justice system, far less funding into educating and into providing those kind of health and social resources. We've also seen that housing, uh, housing segregation has increased dramatically. Segregation of health services has increased dramatically. So these markers of, of structural racism have been on the rise and the sending of funding, public funding into the criminal justice system has also been on the rise. And I think the, you know, there needs to be a curbing of that and uh, just a lot more investment in community as people, others have pointed out. Yeah, so I'm, when you say kind of curbing, it, do you think abolishing the police is the right way forward? Or do you think that's kind of one step too far? Well, you know, uh, Paul Butler has done a lot about, uh, done a lot of work on abolishing prison. And I think there's some important community-based kinds of work that's being done uh, you know, re reconciliation. Uh, there, there are very humanistic kinds of things that are currently being done in communities that could be increased that I, I really do believe that we need to abolish the carceral system because that system is, it's at, in the words of one of the authors, it's part of the afterlife of slavery. I mean, we're continuing that same kind of racial domination that, um, that started off this country. So I, I believe that the policing as we know it uh, and uh, the carceral system as we know it should be abolished. <clears throat> so one interesting question um, just we got from the chat is about whether community accountability justice systems can be as discriminatory and as violent as the police. Do you think that like the new alternatives to the police, like community-based mediation stuff, do you think those are kind of necessarily better than the police or are they, do they have their own drawbacks as well, Michael? Well, I guess- I, I, guess I, would, I, send that, I would send that question to Ejiris. Right, Ejiris, you better. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was actually thinking about um, when Roy was talking about professionalization. So. I'm an anti-violence professional. I have more training than most officers that I have na ever navigated around addressing violence. I have run a neighborhood-based program to address homophobic and transphobic violence in Bedside, Brooklyn on one staff person, 30 volunteers in contact with 1,200 people, right? So we're actually underfunding and defunding the professionals <laughs> in order to maintain, right, a criminal legal system that doesn't do the work half as well. There are professionals who are navigating, um, who are navigating overdoses. There are professionals who navigate mental health. So the issue is we've made an assumption and put people with less training as a professional. And a program can have drawbacks, but honestly, when you are in the same community as people, when you are, when you are doing work with your neighbors, <laughs> when you know the ins and outs and you know what is happening economically in your neighborhood, um, I think that there's just far, like, there's far less ability to embrace, it, to, to embody any of these oppressive systems. So what, so I know some programs that I'm not particularly fond of, right? And at the same time, I think there are, if a program is based locally, where people have actual contact with people, and we share identity and community, right? So when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm intervening in homophobic and transphobic violence within black communities, I also know a whole bunch about what's happening. And I know how to talk to my people and I know how to intervene in an incident. And it's also, we know that person's aunt, we know where they went to school, right? So there's this, this piece around when someone already decides that you're violent and criminal, then there is no way <laughs> that we're already going to be building. Um, we, we shouldn't put all this effort and money and funding into reforming something that has already failed. We should put more money into building up all of us 
who've been doing this work and exhausting ourselves and actually providing results. I once worked with a community member who was attacked on the way home, a black gay man. He called 911. He was attacked again by the officers and beaten in the precinct, right? This is what, like we have an actual opportunity to invest in local programs. And I think that local programs are far less oppressive than what's happening with the police. And we've never had the opportunity to show that because we put, we've decided that violence is supposed to be addressed in the criminal legal system, but that system is violent. Great. Uh, Roy, so, um, you want to hop in? Yeah, so, I, I, so I just, uh, the, the criminal justice system, policing in America, and the criminal justice system, the jails and everything else, it, it costs us $194 billion a year. And I'm not going to argue with the folks on this call about the value of, of, uh, of social programs, because I believe some of that money should go towards social programs that help people the most vulnerable amongst us. But over the last 20 years, it's, a, it's, it's communities that have asked for the police to take more of a role in these issues. And that's, and that's a political issue, right? So when we criminalize homelessness, when we criminalize um, 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 uh, mental illness, when we criminalize every other thing that everybody that's marginalized in our society, we, we leave that to the police who I will agree are not well equipped to deal with those issues. And we, so we find us, we, we find a system using a tool, a blunt tool that is not designed to do, to be that specific tool. We need to, we do need to invest in social programs that help the, the marginalized amongst us and not leave that for the police to have to deal with. The police should be the police uh, the, should be the peacekeepers in communities and respond to real issues that police are supposed to respond to and not have to respond to a homeless person or or, or, or somebody who is having a psychological episode at home and, uh, and marginalizing individuals. A well-trained police officer who is a professional is a critical thinker. Somebody who shows up and has no doesn't allow his bias or her bias to, to, to make a judgment. And, and, and decides what has to be done for the best of everybody that happens to be there in the context of that community. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about <clears throat> having a professional police force. We have to get to that point. The best, there are very good police officers out there trying to do a very tough job, and we have set them up for failure throughout history, and we have to begin the tough work of placing the responsibility where it belongs funding social programs that need to be funded and allowing police to do the job that they were, are really what society expects them to do, to be the peacekeepers and show up when they have to show up and, uh, and respond accordingly uh, in the context of the communities in which they serve. And I, and I believe we don't, we're not used to seeing that as a nation, but I will tell you, there are great community examples of that. I live in Frisco, Texas. Our police department is a great example of that. And until we have that example across the United States, we're always going to have this impression that the police are, are oppressive. So we have to do the tough work to help them. And at the same time, we have to t change people's opinions about the programs that you talk about. We have to fund these programs or people will be marginalized. <clears throat> Great. Thanks for that as well. Um, we just have kind of a minute left. Do you, Jaris, Denise, do you have any closing remarks you'd like to make? Cool. You've already said all you need to say, I guess. <laughs> so thank you so much for every, all our panelists for tuning in. Um, we have a number of other events this week. We have Peter Singer tomorrow and a panel on globalization and coronavirus on Thursday. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <clears throat> thank you.